This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Today's podcast episode, I really enjoyed recording. It was an episode that I struggled to keep short as there was so much that we could have talked about. In the episode, I chatted to former professional footballer Danny Thomas about the psychological qualities that helped him break into football and then stay in professional football. He also went on to talk to me about his debut and we discussed the challenges of transitioning out of professional football and into the workplace too. Enjoy listening. So, Danny, you came through the academies um, at Forest and at, uh, at Leicester. So, you're one of the well, one of the one percent. Uh, I don't know whether you can call it one of the lucky ones, but um, basically, can you just describe what sort of psychological characteristics that you you had and you, you've you've carried through your life and through the academy um, that that helped you go on to to make a career in professional football. Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, one percent, and and you say you you kind of right. It is you do need an element of luck to to make it in the game, and also to sustain a career in the game. So it's one thing becoming a professional, um, and then sustaining it is a completely different kind of uh, uh, kind of process, really. Um, and within that, there's various different kind of elements, strands that will aid you to do that. I don't know the perfect answer and I can only speak on behalf of myself. So for me, I kind of always wanted to be a professional footballer. Um, I mean, it's not something that I was thinking about when I was six, seven, eight. Um, I think I first started playing in a football team when I was around probably eight or nine years old. And then you kind of get a gist of kind of who's good, who's not, who's fast, who's slow, whatever. And I was always one of the fastest um, kind of one of the best in my particular area, especially amongst my kind of local friends. So it went on from there, really. Now, for me, in terms of kind of what aided me, I would say it was that focus on always wanting to be uh, a professional footballer. When I when I reached that stage where I thought, okay, I can actually carve a career out. Um, and it was always focusing on that, but not only just football. I wanted to be well-rounded. So for me, it wasn't just football, football, football. It may have looked like that on the surface, but I was always uh, kind of uh, attentive during school. I always wanted to focus and and, and apply myself correctly because I always knew that when I'm at at school, I'm obviously representing not only myself, but my family. And I also wanted to be respectful of the teachers who are obviously spending their time to teach me whatever they needed to teach me. So it was never a case of, I don't care, I'm going to be a footballer because I, I never knew that and that was never my character anyway. And I could never be a naughty child at school anyway because I knew that when I went home, I'd get in trouble for it because my parents were always well-grounded um, and it was always, one of their mantras was always manners and respect and that goes across everything. So I've carried that kind of all throughout my kind of life in and out of football. Um, so for me, I could never go to school and be one of those naughty kids and have a bit of a chip on my shoulder because I was playing football at a certain level. It was never that kind of thing. So it was it was that, and obviously having a, a, a wild grounded upbringing. I've got four brothers and two sisters. I'm the youngest. They're a lot older than me. Um, so they were already, I wouldn't say established in their lives, but they were already more mature than I was. So I always looked up to them, watched how they conducted themselves in and out of the household. And they always gave me good advice when it comes to kind of anything that I needed to know. Um, and as a child, as you know, you do you do things that a child would. And they would obviously explain to me why I could and couldn't do certain things. Um, so it was always that side of it. Um, and then when I kind of got into the footballing system, it was just kind of focusing on not only trying to make it as a footballer, but just trying to make it in life and become the person that I wanted to be, which is hopefully where I am now. Um, Who who knows? Um, But essentially, it was about listening to the coaches. I say listening in inverted commas because personally, I've I've kind of, I've been told um, that I think laterally uh, in my approach to things and that's kind of in and out of the working environment. So, 
obviously that was kind of there when I was playing football. So I would generally challenge uh, management and not in a negative way. It was just a case of wanting to learn, wanting to kind of educate myself and understand why they wanted me to do certain things and why I was potentially doing certain things. So when they told me to do certain things on the pitch or they wanted us to play a certain way, I kind of wanted to know why. Uh, and I was never afraid, even to this day, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask questions. Um, so for me, sometimes management would be receptive of that. Um, and, and sometimes they wouldn't based on their personal uh, kind of uh, personality and, and obviously how they've uh, approached their kind of uh, journey within the football in life as well. So it, it was frustrating sometimes because you could be seen as someone who would kind of not want to upset the apple cart. It was just someone who kind of wanted to understand why certain things were happening and, and why they wanted me to play a certain way or whatever. So for me, I do believe that that, that helped me because it aided me going forward. And again, I, I would always perform better when a manager understood how how I was as a, as a professional, as a person. Uh, and I, like I said, it just made it easier if I could understand why a manager wanted me or a coach wanted me to do certain things. And again, like I said, it, that wasn't a negative thing. It was just something that, for me, it, it's just I just wanted to know personally uh, that bit too, in terms of why they wanted me to to run in a certain uh, way when I was making a, a particular run. Uh, and then that would aid my progression going forward. That was my kind of approach to it. Uh, like I said, some management would like it and some wouldn't. Some would see it as a, a challenge uh, and they would get frustrated as to why why you're not just doing what they're saying as opposed to why you want to find out why they're saying what they're saying or why they want you to do a certain thing. Now, obviously, the further along I progressed with my career, um, the more questions I would answer purely because you obviously grow up, uh, you become more confident, you've been in and around the game for a longer period of time. So I, I do think that aided uh, my uh, progression within the game. Um, and again, you do need a lot of luck. So I didn't really have many injuries. Uh, my injuries were kind of just muscle based. Um, I think the most serious one I had was uh, a hairline fracture in my back and that hindered my progression for a period of time at, at Leicester. Um, so I'd already made my first team debut at that point. Um, and then not too long after I, I tore my thigh and that kept me, kept me out of the game for, I think it was nine months. Um, and that was very frustrating. Um, but aside from that, my injuries were just your generic kind of hamstring. Um, groin injury. I know a lot of players did suffer from major, major injuries and sometimes it, it hindered their careers because it was always playing on their mind. It just didn't, may may not have uh, kind of healed properly and they may have had to change their game as a result. Now, that never happened for me. So again, quite lucky from that perspective. But for me, I was never afraid to pick up the phone. So my career, I was kind of in and out of clubs uh, throughout my career. I mean, I think my longest contract was when I was kind of uh, starting out in the youth team, it was like a three-year contract. And after that, it was like a year here, two years there. So to have that resilience to then pick up the phone and ask if they'd be willing to sign me or come in on trial or whatever, I was never afraid to do that. Um, and I did that throughout my career. Never really relied on agents to make those phone calls for me. So from that perspective, all of those things combined a lot, a lot of kind of, like I said, along with things like look, um, I played for various different managers that had various different styles of play. Some suited me, some didn't, but I always managed to kind of find myself in and around the team uh, based on kind of adjusting my style of play, based on how they wanted me to to play within their kind of own style of uh, footballing um, kind of progression and, and defending and whatever on the pitch, their style of play as well. So, again, I, I was always someone who wanted to, to listen uh, and obviously do what the manager wanted me to do, um, even if I wasn't happy with it. Um, and I'm not saying that was easy. I'm not saying I didn't challenge managers in a good way, uh, in a respectful way, uh, in a professional way. Um, but I was never someone to kind of, I was never a yes man. I never have been and never will be, uh, even now, even though I'm not playing football. I will always ask questions and always kind of challenge in a pro professional way. And I think those things aided me going forward um, in, a, in order to, kind of make it I say in inverted commas make it within the professional game and sustain a career there that resilience and that will to kind of push through those barriers because it wasn't always easy there's always going to be people that come in uh, a new management and you just for whatever reason don't fit into their style of play or just don't see eye to eye or they've got plans to bring other players in and no matter how well you're playing you're not part of their plans 
So in order to push through those doors, you do need so much resilience, thick skin. Uh, you need to understand yourself. You need to stay well grounded. I was always me first and football a second. So I was always socializing with my friends. Um, I'm so glad that at a young age, I, I did still socialize. And that's a big thing because you're never going to get those years back. So when I say so socialize, do it within your remit. You know your own body. If it's hindering your performance on the pitch, then obviously don't do it or, or don't do it as much. Uh, there's a, there's a kind of, there's a thing in football or sport where people assume from the outside looking in that to make it to the higher echelons or, or to, to, to sustain a career, you need to be a hermit and you can't socialize and it's just focus, focus, focus on that chosen sport. And that's not the case. So many kind of high profile players have interests outside of sport and also they did socialize as well. Um, and that's just the way of life for me. So I'd say all of those things aided me going forward. It's an interesting one you've, you've just mentioned there about, you know, being a hermit there and having interests out of sport. I did, I did some work with a, just had a conversation about it before there with a motocross uh, cyclist. Yeah. And, um, basically it's that sport's becoming quite sport sciencey as well as football and other sports now. So they've got mm. personal trainers, um, they've got mechanics and yeah. Like all, all sorts, loads of different pressures uh, come with that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, one of my bits of advice once was to a to a rider was actually the night before a race. Um, why don't you maybe go for a burger um, mm. and have a pint? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. They, were, they were working themselves up so much and being yeah. so like detailed on the nutrition and everything. They were they were just they were yeah. just weren't at all relaxed when they were racing. Yeah. So yeah, it strikes a. I'll be honest with you, uh, and again, this may go against the grain, uh, and I only really did this uh, in the latter stages of my career. So all throughout your career, they say to eat correctly and whatever, and I still do that to this day, but I didn't really have a diet plan or anything. I'm one of those lucky ones where I can kind of eat whatever I want, and I don't really put on any weight. Um, I still kind of look athletic now. I've always had that athletic build, um, and I was always one of those who – um, I didn't really get nervous or anything before games anyway. Um, so that always aided me on the pitch as well. But when I got to like 26, 27, there was always times where you, you've done everything right, trained well, slept well, eaten properly. And then you go into a game and sometimes you just don't feel right. And then you end up playing poorly. And then there's other times where you've prepared, prepared correctly and done everything right again. You feel great and you go out and play really well. Um, and then... So I started to notice this and I just thought, well, let me, let me try and try different things. So there's a few times where I just had a fry up before a game. Um, and then I went out and got man of the match. There was a few times where I felt absolutely terrible, not mentally, but physically before a game. And then I went out and played really well. So I was thinking, well, what, what is this? What is it? And I always remember Tony Cotty. There was a well known fact that Tony Cotty, if you remember, he used to play for Everton. So he was with me at Leicester. He was coming towards the end of the career whilst I was coming through the youth. And he always used to have a fry up for every single game. And it never really hindered his performance. So I thought, well, are people focusing too much on diet and everything? And I'm not saying go out and eat what you want whenever you want. I'm not saying that. Obviously, there is an element of sports science and reasoning behind it. But I thought, well, let me try it. And then a few times I had a fry up or had whatever and I went to bed at whatever time I wanted to. And then woke up, went out, played really well. Team one, got man of the match. And I just thought, are some, are some people taking it too far with regards to diet, sleeping patterns and, and all those things? And again, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying that I didn't go to the gym and do weights and things. I did all of those things to aid my performance. But I'm just saying that there was certain times where I just thought, I'm just going to relax and just, it's the rest will take care of itself. I've prepared correctly in, in training. I've done everything I can do. It's just down to, I don't know, the universe now to take care of what it needs to take care of. So again, that may go against the grain, but it's just something that I, I kind of thought I'd throw in there just to show people that you just do what's right for you. Be authentic to yourself. I mean, there's players out there. I'm not saying again, this is right, but there's athletes out there who have reached the highest of the highs in terms of their chosen sport. And they smoke, they drink alcohol, they party, they go and do what they want to do whenever they want to do it. That's authentic to, for them and it works for them. It's not going to work for everyone, but I'm just saying not all high profile athletes. And I was never really a high profile athlete. I was a professional one, but I wasn't high profile, but they don't, they're not all hermits. They've got outside interests. It allows them to focus more when it comes to performing on the pitch and things like that. 
But I still hear to this day certain coaches, and I hear people talk within the game, coaches are telling players to just focus on football or just focus on tennis. And I don't understand where they're coming from. I don't understand the reasoning behind that because it doesn't make any sense at all. Like you say, everybody's individual, aren't they? They can yeah. some some can do that and just focus on the one thing, but then others yeah. they, they do they need two or three or four different mm. things. Uh, so they can just switch off and ultimately yeah. just go out there and relax. I, yeah. Know, I suppose I'm, I'm yeah. like you, I, I totally I, 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 I suppose I'm a sports scientist myself in some ways with psychology. Mm. So yeah. I, do, I do buy that and advocate it. This is a short advertisement introducing the sponsor for the show, Chimera Sport who produce a range of sportswear and equipment to help enhance performance and recovery, reducing injury occurrences. And as someone who has had long-standing back issues, I've personally tested some of the garments and I've been more than happy with them. You'll also find that the infrared sportswear has been clinically tested too. So it's great for fitness enthusiasts who want to push harder, go further and recover quicker. More details can be found on the product section of our website and in the show notes. It's a little bit like stats, isn't it? Where some people can get really wrapped up in in stats in their mm. passing or um, tackles or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, and then um, they they end up comparing themselves to other people, and they they just they dig themselves in a hole, and they exactly just, they just forget about just going out there and playing and enjoying what they do. Exactly. Stats are very subjective. And I'll, 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 I know you need to move on to kind of the next uh, phase, but just quickly, whilst you mentioned stats, so very subjective. And I always, when someone mentions stats, I always draw on a, a conversation that I had with uh, a coach just before. Well, it was basically a conversation that I had before I was due to sign for another club and I was potentially going to sign for this club. Um, and again, this goes to show how Certain people will be receptive of certain things and some some people won't. So this coach said to me, um, you didn't get many assists last season. Um, so what what's your reflection on that? So I was like, well, depends how you interpret the the assists. If I put 10 crosses in a game and the striker only scores one goal, that's one assist. If I put three crosses in a game and the striker scores three goals, that's three assists. What's better? And how are you interpreting the stats? And he didn't, he couldn't really answer it. And he, he moved on to the next question. So for me, it's like, how are you interpreting the stats? If you, if you've made a hundred passes successfully, where are those passes going? Are they all going backwards or sideways? Or if you've made 50 passes and they've all gone forward and you've created 15 clear cut chances, which one's better? So it all depends on how you interpret the stats for me. Um, and again, the game's changed slightly more kind of sports science, more stats driven and things like that but if you get caught up in all of that numbers and figures and and, and KPIs and all of that it can end up hindering your performance Um, so it's just about how teams interpret the stats understanding the individual uh, and taking it forward from there Um, so yeah it's just it's just an interesting kind of subject when it comes to stats for me yeah I totally agree and I think as well how those stats are delivered as well to the players important because if people are just going to pick up on the negatives and put them mm. down, then yeah, you, you, you're not going to produce confident and what resilient footballers, are you? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, anyway, how, I'm dying to ask you this question since I'm a Newcastle United supporter. Um, <laughs> you had your debut against them. What was what was it like? You, you said you, you didn't get nervous before games. Were you, were you nervous before that one? Uh, not really, um, just because I was confident in my ability. Uh, that season was amazing for me. It's, it's as if something clicked. And again, I hadn't changed anything. I hadn't changed my approach. I hadn't changed uh, my uh, reasoning on the game. My understanding, obviously, that increased just purely because of learning. Um, but for whatever reason, that season, I was I was still playing in the youth team, doing really well. And then... Uh, progressed into the reserve team while still playing in the youth team um, and I was doing really well in the reserves um, and I was playing against some established players uh, in the reserve uh, league at that time um, and it just went from there and there's rumours about kind of it was around Christmas time uh, the first team had a few injuries and I was already training with the first team as well uh, on some occasions so they were kind of aware of who I was and, and again rumours were going around that I may be involved in the first team at some point. Um, and then it eventually happened. 
and I was on the bench um, for the game at Newcastle. I remember it was at home, uh, Filbert Street, and it was a night game. And night games, for whatever reason, always have like a special uh, atmosphere to them. Um, and yeah, just I was just eager to get on. Um, and when I got on, it was kind of a case of no matter what happens now, I can say that I played in the in the Premiership. It was called at that point. Um, and I just remember being on the pitch and I wasn't in awe of anyone. But one thing that I always remember is, so I was known as a fast player, always one of the fastest in the team and, and whatever else. But when I was coming up against these players, the ones that I assumed on TV weren't really known as fast players were absolutely rapid. And that was because obviously they were physically uh, kind of more uh, more physical than I was in terms of body shape. They were used to playing at that level. The game in itself Premiership at that point was was really really fast anyway. Obviously, it's progressed since then and it's got even faster. But they were also faster upstairs. So when I say upstairs, in terms of their their train of thought and their decision making on the on the pitch was a lot faster than mine, based on the fact that they're more um, kind of they're, they're, they've obviously been in the game longer than I have. They're more experienced than I was at that point. So I just remember looking around thinking, I'm actually out of breath here. Like I'm I'm actually blowing out of my my, my backside uh, and these players are just flying past me um, and that was one thing that I thought wow this is a different level fine in the youth team and absolutely fine smashing it in the reserves but premiership as it was known then as I mentioned different kettle of fish and that's where I kind of thought wow I've got kind of a long way to go even though I was still confident in my ability I knew I've got a long way to go and I think I came on for about 20-25 minutes had uh, a few touches. I, I wouldn't say when I came off, I, I wasn't kind of uh, really, really happy with my performance, but I think I, I did okay. And I had three substitute appearances in total. Uh, I think Leeds, I think it was Le- no Everton, sorry. Um, Newcastle was my debut uh, and then West Ham as well. And then I was on the bench probably about four or five times uh, on top of that as well. Uh, and then that was it. I mean, Martin O'Neill, he was a manager at the time and he was a manager just kept everything simple. Everything was in layman's terms, but everyone knew their job. Uh, and that suited me down to the ground. And he loved me as a player and all of his management staff did as well. So John Robertson, who used to play for Nottingham Forest, uh, he was a, a winger as well, uh, left winger. So he was always kind of uh, coaching me to a certain degree. Uh, he'd watch some of our youth team games and, and like coach from the sidelines and say kind of things that he needed to say whilst you were playing. And then we also had Steve Walford. So if you remember that trio, they all kind of went on to manage, I think it was Villa and uh, Ireland as well. Um, so, yeah, along with, like I said, Martin O'Neill at the helm. So for me, I always worked better when managers kept it simple and just let me play kind of off the cuff, not do what I want, but just play off the cuff. And that allowed me just to enjoy it. When you start giving me millions of instructions and, and things like that, it never really worked. And the long ball game never really worked for me either. So I always liked to play in a team that had elements of passing and, and Leicester at that time although they they played kind of um, I think it was 3-5-2 it's like wing backs it still suited me just because there were still players who wanted to get the ball down and play we had Muzzy is it obviously Hem- Emil Heskey was their underrated player even still to this day people still don't understand Emil Heskey and still say that he wasn't a good player but he certainly was we had Robbie Savage who was underrated as well he could play and we had other players in the team who could play as well so from that perspective it boded bode, bode well for me anyway um, but again it was just a massive experience for me uh, it came kind of last minute uh, I remember calling around friends and, and family and, and just saying look I'm going to be on the bench later on today managed to get a few tickets I think a few players came uh, sorry a few of my friends came and they didn't have tickets, but they ended up watching it in, um, I think it was the, the club shop. There was a screen in there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, we were talking about that the other day, uh, me and a couple of friends as well. So, yeah, just uh, just a great experience. Um, and I wanted more. But as you know, in, in football, in sport, things change overnight. And I new manager came in. Martin O'Neill had the opportunity to go and manage Celtic. So he went to Celtic, took all of his backroom stuff um, and... Yeah, things changed from there. I think I think it was Peter Taylor that came in and it just, new manager came in. I was injured at the time um, and he had his own train of thought, brought his own players in, obviously, that he wanted to bring in. And I ended up just going back into the reserves and 
I just thought I've had a taste of first team football. I've been playing reserve team football for kind of over a season now. I just thought I need to kick on. I don't want to be sitting around and, and rotting in, say, the reserves, so to speak. And I just wanted to play for professional football. So I left and went to Bournemouth. Uh, I think my, Mickey Adams ended up coming in after Peter Taylor. And it was under Mickey that I actually left, um, went to Bournemouth. And that's where my career kind of took off in terms of being a professional footballer. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, to answer your question in short, the experience of uh, playing in the Premier League, the Premiership as it was then, really, really good. Uh, obviously, no one can take that away from me. Um, and it was tough as well because Steve Guppy, if you remember Steve Guppy, he was playing for England at the time. He got called up with Emil Heskey. Um, so he was really well regarded within the game. So for me to kind of, I wouldn't say oust him, but to, to kind of run shoulder to shoulder with him for a short period of time was te- testament to kind of my, um, kind of how I was playing at the time. My performance levels at that time were, were at a high level and I was only 18. So yeah, good times, really good times. Yeah, put another pat on the back to you there. Um, there's, <laughs> How many millions of um, oh, millions of youngsters who get to a decent level in academies would love to have uh, sampled what you did? Mm. Um, you know, I could t- we could talk football for ages, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Sure, um, I'm aware. You know, you've got a you've got an interest in footballers, well, not just footballers, but athletes in general, transitioning out of their sport and mm. the the challenges that come with that. Do you want to just? You tell the listeners a little bit about your experience when you transitioned out of professional football and, and what you're up to now? Sure, yeah. So for me, I mean, my tra- transition away from football was pretty easy. Um, and I, I do believe there's various different elements uh, which made it easy for me. Um, again, I'm one of the lucky ones and I kind of, I count my blessings on a, on a daily basis. I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but We've all seen how hard it is for sometimes athletes to transition away from their chosen chosen sport to then go into Civvy Street or whatever it is. Uh, from a mental perspective, financial, everything, things can go wrong. Um, so for me, my transition, like I said, pretty easy. Uh, I ended up finishing my career in Iceland on a high. So that straight away, that aided me. I finished on a high. We won the league over there. I ended up playing in the Europa League qualifiers. I was playing out of position, so I was playing left back, but really, really enjoyed it to the point where I thought if I'd played left back throughout my career, would I have reached uh, higher levels? I really, really enjoyed it. And what made it easy for me was not only did I play in a team that was total football, but the league in general was total football. It was the top league over there. Um, and like I said, we won the league. So for me, because I was playing left back, my mindset was always, I played as a winger for all these years. So I potentially know what, a winger is going to do so that aided my performance on the pitch anyway won the league came back to the UK I was at a crossroads I was 31 I was thinking well what what am I going to do now continue playing knowing that I'm going to have to work anyway the older I get the harder it is potentially to get a job because my CV is just sports based so I had that to consider while still thinking about maybe carving out another few years in football Anyway, I, I kind of had a bit of a rest because I was I was mentally and physically tired. I had a full season in the UK and then I went straight over and played uh, a full season in Iceland. So I was physically tired and for the first time I was probably mentally tired as well because of the back-to-back seasons uh, without any rest in between. So I had it in my head that I'd come back and, and just have a bit of a, a rest. I had a couple of months off while still speaking to clubs and trying to carve out my next move. And then I was thinking, well, whilst I'm doing this, let me see if I can find something that I may want to do instead of playing football. Uh, and I always knew that I had a bit of an interest in property. I knew it was sustainable. Uh, it's a sustain- sustainable industry to work in. So I thought, well, when I was playing football, I always thought if I can find something sustainable uh, with room for progression, I'll happily transition into that. So property was that. So I went through the conventional methods uh, of uh, the interview process. So I put forward a CV. CV was just sports-based. And this is a massive thing. Anyone that's kind of listening who's playing sport, there's no industry that you're going to step into that wants to know about the medals that you've won or anything. Yes, they're great. And you can you can use that as a talking point. But my CV, I, I, I always say, look, you need to put forward your transferable skills and how they're going to translate into the organization that you're moving into. So you can use your experiences on and off the field, 
in order to portray your transferable skills. So for example, decision making, you're always making quick decisions on the pitch. Decision making as in what, what's your next move going to be? Who are you going to sign for? How is that going to impact your family life? Do you have to move home? Um, resilience within the game. A manager loves you. He leaves. She leaves. New manager comes in. They don't like you anymore. Are you going to be resilient and try and still continue and pursue that uh, club and gain a position in the team? Or are you going to move on, show resilience elsewhere, but still stay in the game? So all of those things, I had to portray all of those experiences on my CV. Managed to get an interview. It was a two-step interview process, so two separate interviews. And I managed to get the job at my first attempt. So I didn't experience that rejection. Now, if I had me, me being me, yeah, I would have been upset, but I would have moved on and tried to still maybe go for a second interview elsewhere and, and a third and whatever until I actually got that role that I wanted. So I didn't have to go down that route, luckily. So that, again, aided my transition. And I was working for a company that I knew um, there was room for, for me to progress into. So... Again, I, I went and worked in an, uh, an estate agent and I was uh, within the lettings team in there. And then up until September last year, I was always working in an, uh, a letting agent. Um, and then um, now I've progressed onto something else, still within property, but I work for a, a software technology company. We sell uh, a software to investors, developers, anyone interested in property, uh, and it allows them to go and source um, sites of opportunity for them uh, to invest in. So whether it be land, commercial or residential, and we provide the data behind that. So ownership information, uh, kind of information regarding the size of the site, building footprint and all those things that you need to, to put in uh, to place before investing in a property. So that's where I am now working from home. Uh, it's all kind of online based uh, and the company's called Nimbus uh, Maps. Now for me, all of those things aided my transition. Now, on the day I got offered the job, I also got offered to go and uh, kind of train uh, with a, a team just to prove my fitness. And then after that, once I've done that, they'd offer me a contract. So it wasn't a trial, essentially. It was just kind of them offering me an opportunity to go and just prove my fitness. Now, I could have gone down that route, but then I thought, I'm, I'm going to need to work. So this contract that they're potentially going to offer me, maybe a year, two years max, then I'm going to be 33, pushing 34, I'm still going to be in the same situation. So I turned that opportunity down and just, uh, like I said, uh, decided to work in uh, CV Street. And it went from there and I progressed and I learned the ropes and I started from the bottom. My salary was probably, say, a third of what I was normally uh, earning. So that was a massive hit. So again, are you prepared to take that that risk and, and, and earn a lot less than what you were to get your foot in the door? I still see a lot of people now kind of saying they want to do certain things, but they want to they want to earn what they're earning in football and it, it very rare that someone's going to give you that opportunity knowing that you've got no experience and give you top money you're going to have to obviously show them that you're willing to learn show them that you've got the capabilities to go and do what you said you can do on your CV and also do what they say or what they want you to do what the company wants you to do so another thing it's pointless lying on your CV because you're going to have to back it up in the interview and also back it up within the organization if you do get off for the job. So just be as honest as possible. But I think for me, it was a case of I, I knew what I kind of wanted to do to a certain degree. I, I was happy to work, uh, well, happy to work, go and work. I wasn't embarrassed about telling people that I'm now no longer playing football and I'm now working in the state agents. The reason for that, I think the reason that I didn't find it embarrassing is because Obviously, property, it, it, there's nothing really to be embarrassed about. Working in estate agents, that's kind of a viable job. Now, if you were, were to ask me if you were to go and work in, say, a corner shop stacking shelves, that would have been slightly harder for me to convey that information to other people. But I was still would have been happily uh, able to do that based on the fact that I had a family to support. So, again, it would have been going in there and utilising that experience that customer facing role, speaking to people on a certain way, because football banter is completely different to office and, and whatever else that you're doing. So you need to obviously understand that as well. Um, if it was a case of going in and stacking shelves somewhere, I would have just used that experience the best way I could have to then push on to the next job. Um, so it's just about utilizing your time and not, not wasting your time whilst you're kind of in whatever role you're in. And the first one you find may not be the one that you end up in. Um, you may not enjoy it. You may use it as a stepping stone like I did. I always knew that, yes, 
fine, fine working in an estate agent. That was my foot in the door. But long term, I knew that it was never going to be for me. And now I've moved on to that next level within the property industry. So all of those things uh, helped me. Like I said, I, I'm one of the lucky ones. Not everyone's going to fall into uh, an industry that they're, they're kind of happy with straight away. Some may find it hard just because they were always in that bubble of being a footballer or a tennis player or a rugby player. I was never that person. I was always me first, like I said, and then football a second. It's up to other people how they want to portray you. Uh, you can aid that to a certain degree based on your personality, but still to this day, people will always see you as, oh, you were that footballer or you are that footballer. But that was never really my identity. So a lot of people will say they feel like they feel like they've lost their identity when they've they've left their chosen sport. I was never that person. For me, when I got off of that job, it was a massive relief because it was like I've achieved something by actually finding a job off my own back. Um, and I've done kind of, I'd say in inverted commas, every boy's dream, that being a professional footballer. But now I can show people that um, I'm not or I wasn't just a footballer. There's more facets to, to me. I've got more uh, strings to my bow to that to that extent. Yeah, it sounds from what you're saying, you mentioned a little bit earlier the self awareness piece. Um, mm. That clearly, you know, you've been quite self aware. You've probably been aware that through your football and career that you've built up a lot of these skills: mm. the, focus, the focus, the respect, the what commitment, leadership skills, and mm. and obviously you've gone and sold yourself uh, really well. So, so yeah, no, uh, you know, well, well done on that on that one. Thank you. Um, yeah, and in, in terms of some advice then for for younger footballers from our conversation are you able to just to give them three three takeaways yeah i'll try and do my best and keep it to three i mean there's <laughs> there's, there's millions out there yeah and you probably noticed I, I can talk all day and i, I don't want to obviously do that so for me um ask questions um be focused um and when i say focused be focused on your chosen sport but not only that be focused on yourself your own well-being um and um don't be afraid to kind of make mistakes you're not always going to get it right you may sign for a club and think this isn't right for me um and it may be time for you to then look for another club and, and things like that i mean it, it, you can obviously ban that down to many different things in terms of kind of don't be afraid to make mistakes but on the pitch do what you need to do in terms of kind of portraying yourself in the best light possible everyone's got their own style of play Obviously, managers will want you to play a certain way. Listen to your managers, but be authentic to yourself as well. Be that free spirit. Obviously, when you're playing football with your friends at school or in the playground, at the park or whatever, you're playing off the cuff. You're doing things that come naturally to you. Go and uh, kind of relay that on the pitch. Bring that kind of uh, raw emotion, those those things that you do naturally in terms of your ability onto the pitch as well. And you'll notice the difference when you start being robotic and things, you're playing out of your, your comfort zone, you're not doing things that come naturally to you, that's when your kind of performance will dip. And I'm not saying you can't go out and, and learn new skills. I'm not saying you can't go out and learn how to head the ball or how to cross the ball correctly and things like that. You can learn those things. And when you're learning, you will naturally pick up your own best version of how to do those things because you're obviously going to learn in a way that, yes, the coach is telling you, but you're going to pick it up and understand it the best way you can based on your own personality and understanding. So, yeah, it's, I'd probably say those three things. But then, again, I could give you another 50. Um, it's it's so hard to pinpoint it to three. Do you like those three things regardless of whether, yeah, there, there could be 50? I mean, the, <laughs> the, the asking questions one, like, yeah, so many youngsters struggle with that, don't they? And challenging mm. like people who they, they look up to, if you like, with coaches. But it's, yeah. yeah, it's such a valuable skill, and mm. the, I'll, I'll, I like I like the focus one. I'll, I'll 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 skip it though because the the um, I suppose I say quite a lot. The whole don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's probably why a lot of footballers come to a sports psychologist. Really, mm. um, just be yeah, being able to freely express yourself and yeah, play play without any any expectations really is is mm -hmm. is so so valuable because yeah yeah so often people expect so much from themselves yeah and they, and they worry so much about what other people think that they that they just they just can't do it and they're, they're frozen when they go out there exactly yeah the hardest thing for a player is to have the ball 
if you break it down, the hardest thing is to have the ball and then to retain it. Now, I always say I was a winger, so I was expected to go out and, and run past the fullback and get a cross in or get a shot in or whatever. I was always that type of player. Now, for me, I was a confidence player as well. And I'd probably say 99% of players are, if not all of them, because if you haven't got the confidence, it's going to impact your performance anyway. If I tried to take on a defender and I got tackled, if I then went into my shell, which very rarely happened, but if I did, it would hinder my performance. So as I got older, I just thought, well, what's going to happen? If he tackles me, I'll just try and take him on again. And inevitably, I'd end up taking him on and then that builds confidence. And then you just go from there. Many times I'd have a shot and the shot would go over, over the crossbar or even over the stands. And you'd hear people laugh and whatever, and teammates would be on your back or whatever. Pick up the ball again. I remember I picked up again in the particular game and I did exactly the same thing, probably a bit further out and it ended up going in. <laughs> and it's just, it just goes to show that if you don't try, you're never going to know. It's Again, confidence is a major thing, but don't be afraid to make those mistakes. If you don't try, how are you going to, progress you're never going to know whether you can do a certain thing unless you try those things anyway so i try and bring that into everyday life i always say look even when i speak to clients if you don't ask the answer is always going to be no so you, you may as well ask the question uh, and that could be verbally or, or physically on the pitch or whatever it is that you're doing completely agree i mean if you look at the last what 10 years or so with messi and ronaldo and the amount of goals they've scored Mm. Um, yeah, I bet they've missed 10 times the amount of goals they've actually scored, but exactly, they just, yeah, they just keep coming back for more and more and asking for the ball. And yeah, exactly, yeah, and yeah. the rest is history, <laughs> fearless, fearless, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I've, I've loved the conversation, Danny. Um, if the listeners want to reach out to you and have a chat with you or yeah, just make contact with you, where, where can they find you? Sure, yeah. Firstly, appreciate, obviously, uh, asking me to come on. Appreciate the time. Enjoy the chat. Um, in terms of finding me, I'm, I'm someone who's pretty new to social media. And the only reason I'm on there is based on my podcast. So my podcast is called Back of the Net and Beyond. And that's where I speak to athletes, whether it be current or former athletes, anyone kind of uh, who's got an interest in sport. So from a professional perspective, anyone who's from a particular organization in sport, I'll speak to them on my podcast and the main focus is uh, I'm basically speaking to them about transitioning away from sport to another career and the transferable skills that athletes have as well. So again, back of the net and beyond, that can be found on Instagram, Facebook. Sometimes I do post little snippets on Insta, um, sorry, on LinkedIn as well. Um, in terms of LinkedIn, I'm on there just under my personal name, Danny Thomas. You'll also be able to find me personally on um, Instagram or uh, Facebook, if you type in my name, it's all interlinked within uh, my podcast, Back of the Net and Beyond. Um, and that's basically it, really. So again, uh, have a look out for that. Pretty interesting. It's not your generic kind of podcast. I don't normally, well, I don't talk about kind of what what your favorite boots were and who was the funniest in the dressing room. <laughs> it's not that type of uh, podcast nothing against those podcasts at all but for me I've been in the game so I know kind of what perils there are within the game when it comes to transferable skills and trans uh, transitioning away from football or any sport into another career so for me I wanted to focus on that and that's the only reason why I'm on social media because um, again I didn't really want to be on there unless I was kind of adding any particular value so for me the podcast allows me to do that and hence I've only been on there for probably over just over a year now yeah you're certainly adding value no doubt about it i've, I've listened to a, a good number of episodes and yeah you're doing <laughs> great work so yeah keep, keep it going <laughs> it's it's mm. uh, it's such a valuable area though as well with when, mm. when with when you look at how many athletes do do have struggles when they when they do leave the professional sport sure so i'll put uh in the show notes a uh, link to the to your podcast and to your to your social media there Brilliant. And yeah, I appreciate uh, your time, Danny. Uh, I've really loved the conversation. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate, uh, obviously, your time as well. And thanks for asking me to come on. Uh, hopefully, you get some value from from this as well. And yeah, hopefully, we'll, we'll speak again soon. Um, and then, yeah, uh, go from there. Yeah, no, most definitely. Thank you. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, keeping the conversation short was really, really tough. Danny's insights to me highlighted why mental toughness is so important and why clubs and players themselves should really be looking at proactive ways to develop this character trait. 
Danny clearly had immense commitment. He made many sacrifices along the way to ensure that he wasn't distracted and maintained a positive career. He had confidence in his ability and he had what you could call leadership qualities in that he was assertive. He questioned coaches and more experienced pros. And in that environment, that is tough to do at times. And it's clear that it didn't phase Danny. And certainly for youngsters who are looking to try and progress into professional football, that to me would be a big area I'd be looking to try and improve. So yeah, I'm really grateful to Danny and to you, the listener. You know, I get lots of positive comments from different people and interact quite a lot with different people on social media about the podcast. So it's great to know that we're making a positive difference here. What I'd also love to know from you would be, who would you like me to chat to? What sort of topic would you like me to unpick? You know, please do get in touch via social media and let me know. Until next time, have a great week. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.